Hi folks, welcome back to the shop. Um, I've been asked a lot to make a video on how to make a two-part silicone mold. And in doing so, there's several things that we have to do. So I'm going to do this in a several multi-part uh, video. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is some of the basics, how the, the theory that goes into making silicone molds in the first place, in fact, all mold making. And it's pretty basic, really minor stuff, but it's very important. And then we'll talk a little bit about materials and then we'll get into actually doing it. So uh, one of the things I was waiting for was I wanted something to make a mold of. And I found one. This is a small object. It's a rat fink skull, uh, head. Um, and I've prepared it a little bit. To I've started to prepare it to do the mold. But this brings up a pretty important aspect. And one of them is... Um, a fundamental in mold making that is soft to hard and hard to soft. Let me explain. Soft to hard means if I'm going to mold something that is soft, like a clay sculpture or this is a silicone head, right? So this was originally done in clay and then I took a hard mold because I was going to cast it into silicone, a soft giving material. The point of this is all based on undercuts, and I'll talk about what an undercut is in a minute. But know this, soft materials flex. So I want a hard mold to go up against this, otherwise the whole thing can get wonky. Conversely, in this case, I'm doing a hard object. This is just a little uh, piece of plastic, and I'm going to be casting them in resin. So with that, hard to soft, I want a soft mold. The whole point of this is this concept of undercuts, which I'll show you here. Okay, so the fundamental question is, what exactly is an undercut? Imagine you had a piece that had something like this, a shape like this, okay? Pretty basic, no big deal. but. If the piece kept going back and I wanted to take a mold that would come off this way, each one of these would be an undercut. That is, if this mold material, which is, if this is my, my uh, sculpture or my creation, and this is made out of something hard, like say a 3D print, and out here was my mold material, okay? Let's say I made this mold material out of hard plastic, resin, or cement, like ultra cow, or plaster. You can see, if I went to remove these two things, they would lock together here at the undercuts. Um, another example of this would be, imagine if one of these undercuts was further cut in, like that. Now... I've got basically a compound undercut. There's no way that this can be removed from this. So the way to get around this is by having either your material or your, uh, your casting material or whatever you're making the mold of soft or the mold soft. So it would have some release, some give here. That's the idea. What? If I'm doing a solid uh, hard piece, as a cast or the original that I'm taking the, the mold from, then the mold has to be soft. Conversely, if I'm doing something soft like latex or silicone or clay, then I want a hard casting material or uh, mold material so that this will hold its shape when I make the mold. One of the two has to be able to hold their shape under pressure and moving around and wiggling. The second concept to mold making is, if you have a two-piece mold, so you've got your object in the middle, and you've got a cut line, and you've got two halves of the mold. Does that make sense? You've got a top and a bottom of this mold that have to come apart and go back together. Here's the thing. Make this more of a circle. Um, what I want is the edge line to be right through here, okay? What I don't want is for the sides to be offset. So if this one goes this way and this one goes this way, 
you won't get your perfect sphere here or whatever shape this is. It'll be offset or you can twist it, you can torque it in these two different ways. So that would be offset. The key, well, the way to get around that are keys. Keys can be cut in. Let's say this is a piece of the upper part of the mold. And here's a key that's a piece of the lower part of the mold. These keys lock these molds together. So you cannot get the offset or the torsion, the twist. Keys are very important. They're very easy to do. There are several different types of keys. You can do kind of a wedge-shaped key. You can do uh, keys that lock into one another, which are kind of like shaped like that, that'll snap in. And that, of course, would only be used in soft molds. You can do a raised key that'll kind of go throughout the entire circumference. Or the easiest ones, which are just these, they're almost like an eraser head. But the cool thing about these is they lock in, they don't move, and most importantly, they're very easy to create. So with all those things in mind, let's get back to mold making and go into some of the other basics. Okay, some of the basics about silicones. First and foremost, all silicones are a two-part mix. You're going to have a catalyst and a base. The base rubber, one is tin-based, the other is platinum-based. Now, the platinum cure silicone is extremely finicky. Uh, it will last forever. Molds made out of platinum uh, cure silicone will last longer than molds made out of tin-based silicone. However, platinum-based silicone will be affected by heat, humidity, Cold, all sorts of different chemical reactions can come to play in platinum-based. Tin-based, which is much more robust as far as dealing with all those finicky elements, the tin-based will also last almost as long as a platinum-based if you take some precautions. And I'll talk about those in just a second. The platinum cure, I would suggest not using it for your first few times around. Here's why. Most of your tin-based silicones are going to be uh, strong enough for what you're doing. And I mean, you can get a couple hundred poles out of most of these, depending on what you do and how you do it. That includes what casting materials you're casting into these, as well as how you go about doing that. You can either cast them very quickly, in which case you're going to shorten the life of the, of the mold. You can do all kinds of things that are going to shorten the life of the mold. There are a lot of things that you can do to lengthen the life of the mold. And I'll give you some examples. Okay, here I have an example of a lot of different types of molds. Uh, we'll talk about these two in a little bit. First, I want to show you a fundamental difference. This mold I've beaten the hell out of and used for years and years and years. It's probably got a couple hundred pulls out of it. However, you'll notice it's still soft, supple, and it's working great. Hasn't lost any detail. You can still see the woman's face and all her hair and everything else. Conversely, this one has only been pulled about maybe 30 times. <laughs> you can see it's starting to disintegrate. Uh, you can still see the face in there, but it was quickly done, poorly done. And two other things play a part. The biggest one is what I'm casting in this. This one I'm mostly casting in cement, like plaster, UltraCal 30, that kind of thing. That doesn't do anything to the silicone. It keeps the silicone much more together. It does not leach out any of the silicone oil, and the oil is what keeps the silicone supple. This one, on the other hand, I've been casting resin in for years. And this is about 25 years old. They both are. They're about the same age. But this one was poorly done in two ways. One, it was quickly put together. It's just a single cut mold. You can see I just cut down the side to open it up to pop these things out. There are a lot of undercuts. And it's poor. It's dealing with resin, which does leach all that silicone oil out of these things. Finally, I have this third one. This also has probably had a couple, maybe thousand pulls out of it. This one is platinum silicone. It's much tougher. It's lasted a lot longer, but you can see it's starting to deteriorate. 
but I've also been casting this resin, like that one, into this one. So these last a lot longer, but how many thousands of poles do you actually have to pull? Depends. All three of these molds are about 25 to 30 years old. I've had them around for a long time, done a lot with them. Secondly, there are stiffer and softer silicones. The softer silicones usually are a shore A hardness of about 20 to 25, somewhere in there, maybe up to 30. When you get up into the 30s and 40s, though, you start getting this much stiffer stuff. You can see even the thin wall on this is very stiff. It's holding its, its position. This also has only had plaster cast into it. Therefore, it is holding up just fine, even after about, this is about 20, 25 years old, somewhere like that. The last thing I want to mention about mold longevity, actually two things. One is using a mold release. Yes, silicone doesn't need a mold release, technically. However, a mold release will pre pre put a sort of preventative barrier between the silicone and the casting agent. So yes, heat, things like that will affect it. But the biggest one is if you look closely, if you look at the back side of this one, even though it's dirty, you can see it's glass smooth. You can see that reflection that I'm getting on it, probably. This one, on the other hand, you see all these little holes in it? See all those little bubbles? Well, those bubbles go throughout all the silicone. Kind of makes it spongy. And while silicone is soft anyway, well, not that one. Silicone is soft anyway. This sponginess is not desirable. Those bubbles weaken, obviously, the silicone. And the way to get that out is kind of advanced. It's called de-airing or degassing. De-airing and degassing does require some special tools, which not everybody will have, although they are accessible. They are, you can get them. You can get a degassing setup that'll do anything these sizes and even a little larger. You can build a chamber for well under $100, thanks to Harbor Freight. And we'll talk about that in a future video. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about what to do, what kind of silicone to use, and how to use it, I'm going to talk the last little bit about setting up for a silicone mold. Fundamentally, if you look at this object, it's got undercuts in all different directions, all over the place. There's these ears, which are really problematic, and there's several ways I could deal with that. One is I can simplify the mold by designing it to come off in these two directions. So these ears are no longer a major undercut, they'll just have this slight undercut in here and out here. But that is fine. Silicone, the, the bendiness of silicone will compensate for that. Same with this nose, would be, it would be able to lock in on either side here. However, because of silicone, it'll let that go. Next couple of things to talk about. You can design a mold for a hard mold if you really wanted to. You could have a piece that goes in here, pieces on either side, pieces like this, or you could cut this object apart and have all kinds of pieces everywhere to open it up. But silicone makes that a lot easier. All I need to do is put this on end, make a cut line right along here, and then I can have a piece that'll come off this way and a piece that'll come off this way and it won't lock in. Second thing, where do I put the cut line? Well, fundamentally, if you have an object that gets really fat and then goes thin, like this does, you can see it's pretty fat around the middle. So that's pretty much where I'd put my cut line just to make it easier to separate. The other thing is a cut line will leave a seam. So know that I'll have to clean that seam up if I want to later on. So you may want to hide the seam somewhere where it's easy to cut away or sand off. We'll talk about that later. The other thing is this has a tongue that sticks out of the side here. So I've removed the tongue because there's no way to mold that without a multi-part mold. So what I'm going to do here is I'll simply set the tongue in part way so that half of it is on the top and half of it's on the bottom of this mold. And then I can fill it all all together. The last thing I want to talk about about preparation and I've started and I decided to leave it semi started not to clean it up too much just so you can see. This 
has a lot of holes in it. As I mentioned, it's empty plastic. The problem with that is, remember, the silicone that we're putting on this is under hydraulic pressure. It's weight and it's very viscous. So it's going to seep into all those little cracks, fill up the interior of this, and you'll lose a whole lot of silicone. You may destroy your original and all kinds of things are going to happen. So the obvious thing to do is to fill up those cracks, right? So what I've done here is filled them up. Now here's the key. You cannot use with silicone anything that has sulfur in it. So Roma clay, a lot of the plastilines that you'll get from the dollar store, that kind of thing. If you smell them, they smell very sulfury. You can't use those because that will retard the silicone. Even tough tin based silicone will be slightly retarded by it, meaning it won't kick off. It won't cure. So what you want to do is fill these in with a clay that doesn't have any any sulfur in it. And the easiest way to do that is smelling it. If it smells like, well, if it smells strongly, don't use it, generally speaking. The second way to deal with this, if you can't find anything that, that you're not sure about, and a lot of the clays will say sulfur-free on the, on the packaging. But if you cannot find one that is sulfur-free, the other way you could go about this is hitting it with spray paint or hitting it with crystal clear or hitting it with a mold release. Those things can all help. And you're going to mold release this anyway. However, keep in mind the mold release will not encapsulate the sulfur enough usually, especially for silicone. It'll, I mean, for platinum, it will never work. For tin-based, it should work, but it might have some problems. So the best way to do it, if you don't know if it's sulfur-free clay that you're using, obviously using a plastiline that is a, it stays wet. You can use a water-based clay and that'll do it. Most of the plastilines are, will label them uh, whether they're sulfur-free or not. There are a lot of different ones now. So the thing you want to do is basically smear over all these little holes and cracks and crevices with the clay and then go in there and start cleaning out cleaning off the excess clay. It's pretty easy to do, as you can see. I'm doing it fairly, fairly quickly here. You just keep rubbing over the top of it and you'll see quite distinctly where I have non-distinct lines here. If I get that clay off of there, you can see it starts to sink in and it just fills in the area. And color is a very helpful thing. Obviously, it'll show you where the clay is and where it isn't, and it'll make it easier to clean off. So, sulfur-free, and make sure you close up all those gaps, and go ahead and think about making a mold. By the way, you're going to make the mold halves. You're going to separate those halves using the same sulfur-free clay. So, it's a good idea to have some around, and it's very cheap. We'll move on to the next step in the next video. We'll start setting this up and laying out the actual mold. And I'll show you some of the techniques of doing that. Thanks for coming. Please like and subscribe. And I'll talk to you soon.